I have a six-year-old daughter uh, who just, you know, loves princess stories, and so um, I thought it'd be really neat to do a princess story out of the Bible. And the story of Ruth is a wonderful story. It's a love story. It's a story about devotion to your family. And so we decided uh, to do it as a prequel uh, to King George and the Ducky and set it in the King George and the Ducky world. Oh, now, now, now I'm happy! Storyboarding is my favorite part of the whole process, and it's something we do right up front, right after the script is written. It's like putting the whole show like a comic strip. You just draw one, one drawing for each action. Todd Carter and Brian Roberts did the majority of the storyboards. Brian and Todd came up with some great gags, and even our editor came up with a gag. Uh, Joel hit the gag when the little pea jumps off the diving board yelling, matzo ball, instead of cannonball. Love that gag. Now, today we got a letter from Cody Gordon in Evergreen, Colorado. After we storyboard the whole show, we get all, all the drawings pinned up and we'll pitch it to the rest of the company. And doing the story pitch can be exhausting because it's like a 45-minute one-man play. It's like a totally cute baby! <laughs> it not only gives everyone else a chance to understand what we're working on, but you know, if we're pitching it and the rest of the company's not laughing at the jokes we want to put in there, we know, okay, we've got some trouble. We have some things we need to rework in here. In all my years, this has got to be the sorriest lot of nights I've ever seen. You'll never be fit for battle. Sire, yes, sire. <laughs> it worked. The idea for the look of this show went back to a lot of the old uh, MGM musicals where they would um, build part of a set and behind that have a painted background. And it looks very storybookish, very fairy tale. In fact, if you look at um, movies like, um, like Wizard of Oz, you can actually see it's a painted background. This show marked a real extension of our use of flats. And what I mean by flats is in 3D animation, everything has to be built or constructed, almost like you're making it in real life, like you were building it out of paper or cardboard. But instead of building this enormous set that goes off onto the horizon, we can just build the foreground areas, just the, the hills and a few trees, and then the background is just one painting. Ultimately, the things you see on screen are all computer, but most of them, if not all of them, come out of hand-drawn art. Uh, that's, that's what everything springboards off of. Whenever we cast these shows, you know, we have our stock cast to choose from, and uh, usually you know, different characters play the similar parts. You've got Nezer, who's usually the big heavy or the, uh, some sort of leader, and uh, Larry's often the, the, you know, a kind hero. And, um, but we had the story of Princess Petunia, and we really didn't have a character who could fit into that role. We don't have a lot of female characters to choose from. We hadn't had a leading female character since Esther in the, Esther the Girl Who Would Be Queen. And Esther was kind of a problematic actress. When we originally designed her, we designed this great hair that kind of flopped around all over the place. But when we produced that show, her hair didn't always work so well. And so we would have shots where we would have to re-render it over and over because her hair was going crazy. So at the end of that show, when we finished Esther, it was basically pronounced that we would never be using that character again because she was just too difficult to work with. So Princess and the Pie Wars gave us the opportunity to create a brand new female heroine for VeggieTales. It's a lot of work for us because there's a lot to build a new character, to design a new character. So the first big challenge with a new character is we don't know what their personality is like. Oh, oh, <laughs> missed the door. <laughs> the next big challenge that we have is what do they really look like? There must have been piles and piles of Sweet Petunia drawings. Originally Sweet Petunia looked like uh, Larry wearing girl's clothing and that looked a little weird. When you're designing a character also, you're really going for a uh, design that's really appealing. You know, she's a vegetable, so you have to, the challenge is to make a vegetable look pretty. Wow, Nona sure has changed. And then we have to eventually get it into a 3D world. So that's the third challenge that we have to face. So what we do, and I, I like to do it, we did it with Hope when we did the Easter Carol, is we build or sculpt a maquette of the new character. When we design a character, we'll do several views of her as a drawing. But even then, there's some information that's hard to tell for a computer person to, to model it or to sculpt it in the computer. So the best thing is to sculpt a, a, a real version of it. In fact, I sculpted this maquette just to give a complete view all the way around so you can see all the detail on her. And even sculpting it, you find out things that you drew that aren't really possible in reality. Well, once we kind of know, we've decided what the type of character is, 
we may not know who the voice is going to be. In the case of Princess Petunia, we kind of knew what the character was like and what we wanted out of the character. So then we just had auditions. The person we found to voice the character just did a great job. You know, she, she's uh, the wife of somebody that works here at Big Idea and, and a professional actress. Her voice had some of the, the you know, the inflection and, and sort of the sweetness that we were looking for. We really loved the character of, of Princess Petunia, or, or Petunia, and she's actually coming up in, in the very next episode, which is Minnesota Cuke in the Search for Samson's Hairbrush. Obviously with Princess we're doing this medieval sort of story. We needed a kind of a narrator for part of the story and it's, it's a lot of fun to have singing narration. All of us were Monty Python fans and so we naturally think of you know a bunch of guys singing in falsetto voices and so we always thought yeah and we hope that works you know. So we get all through it, we write all the music and, and we get there to the booth and start recording. And it was the scariest thing I've ever heard. But then we, you know, we kept working at it. We got all the voices layered together and got them singing and it, it, it's pretty funny. There are some portions in Princess where there's quite a bit of talking going on, a lot of dialogue, interaction with the characters. But it's fun to pick up on all their little emotions as they're talking to each other and play those into the music and add a little bit to the emotion and or if if one of them is surprised by something, we play right into that and, and help the audience follow that along. You know, for example, when, when the princess is asking Larry to joust for her so that they can get the other half of the duck, you know, we wanted to create a little tension there. We see Larry thinking, boy, could I really do that? I mean, this is a big deal. Sure, I'll do it. So all of a sudden the music turns around immediately and we're surprised, she's surprised. Wow, he said yes, he's gonna do it, that's great. So it's fun to, to read into that and add the music that helps us move through that scene. I know this is a lot to ask, but I want, ahem, uh, I need you to joust for me. Well then, yes. Yes? Yes, of course I'll joust for you. And now it's time for The Blues with Larry. I love the silly song, The Blues with Larry. And it was funny because Tim and I got to work on it together. Tim came with this concept of, um, you know, Larry singing the blues. And of course, Larry's just way too happy to sing the blues, so it's sort of a lost cause. My first idea for that was probably about five years ago. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if you had a character who wasn't sad enough to sing the blues? Because I had a happy childhood, and I had the song in my head for a long time about the happy childhood blues. Oh, happy, sticky, happy, sticky, happy, happy, sticky, happy place. We've looked at a lot of Bible stories that we've told at Veggie Tales. We've told Josh and the, and the Great Wall. We've done David and the Giant Pickle. But there's a lot of other stories in the Bible that are, that are maybe more difficult to tell or they're really expansive. And Moses is a story like that. So we thought, well, we want to tell something about Moses. So how do we do that? And so we opted to go for you know, Moses when he was a baby and what the impact of that was on his family. The story of uh, Miriam and Moses, I mean, here you got this sister who risked her life for her little brother. And that's just a great story of putting someone else's needs before yourself. The original story of Babysitter in Denial, we had uh, put a lot more of the story back in where the, the guards were actually searching for the babies. Because if you remember in the biblical story, they were looking for the baby boys to take them away. And we had several scenes where the guards were, you know, looking through the house for, for the baby Moses. And it was kind of funny. We had made, you know, the baby was being hidden in this place and that, and a lot of funny gags. But unfortunately, when we put it in the story where it was, um, it made it look like Miriam was watching out for her brother, which was good. But in our story, she hadn't learned that lesson yet. So she was actually acting on putting her brother first before we wanted her to know that that's what she was supposed to do. And we also had to make sure that she didn't know that the guards were uh, creating a danger. Because if Miriam was uh, reluctant to take care of her brother when she knew his life was in danger, it'd make her very unlikable. But now we have all these shots that have already been animated of peas, you know, coming in looking for the baby. So we thought, well, let's not let them go to waste. So we put those as a, as a nice little tidbit over the credits. So when you see those in the credits, you'll know those were originally in the, in the scene where Miriam's getting the food uh, thrown on her by Baby Moses. With Babysitter, when we came to working on the score, uh, it takes place in Egypt, Middle Eastern sounds. Okay, what, what does that conjure up? A lot of ethnic drums, some flutes and whistles and reedy type instruments, a lot of stringed instruments. So I had some of those instruments lying around. I was able to pick up a, a dumbek here. And this one's actually made in Turkey. And I used this on some of the, some of the show. 
Sometimes when we're creating themes, we're taking not only melodies, but instrumentation styles. So we look at the Egyptian groups and we have a different sound for that than we do for the Jewish family. Uh, with the Jewish family, we use some of the traditional Jewish sounds with clarinet and some of the stringed instruments. I think the lesson for uh, Princess and the Pie Wars is really important for kids, to be able to put others in front of yourself, it's especially you know, when it comes to your family. And the reason that God gives us families is so that we can, we can help one another. And we do that best, we love each other best by putting the other person first. I just love my little brother, is all. <laughs> Nona is Nona is actually my mom's name, and it was it was kind of neat through the whole development of Princess and the Pie War because um, you know it's a story about loving your family, and you know sooner or later my whole family came into the whole into the whole mix. You know when um, Bob and Larry are first on the countertop, Larry you know introduces the fact to Bob that he's got three brothers. <laughs> you know and Bob is surprised by that he never knew, and Larry is shocked that he never told Bob. He must have told them. And um, you know he has Mark the cucumber, Steve the cucumber, and Bob the cucumber. And of course Bob would have remembered if Larry had a brother named Bob. But those are my brother's names. And then um, you know Nona uh, is my mom's name, and you know who played that that role. And then um, uh, Larry makes mention of his dad, you know, being in orbit, so he has to call him, you know, to you know wish him happy birthday. And my dad, although we don't name him, my dad's name is Dennis, but uh, my dad worked in the space program, so that's why the astronaut thing. He wasn't an astronaut, but he worked in the space program, so so worked them all in. So let's take a look at a short scene here and see how the score affects the story. First, we'll play it without any music. Now let's add the music back to the scene and see how that carries the story, how it adds that emotion. When I was taking art classes, um, you know, back in the late 80s, it must have been early 90s, and I was really into German Expressionism. There was just a lot of angst and a lot of, you know, sorrow in those paintings. And, and I thought, oh, it'd be really cool, you know, if I could paint like that or draw like that. So I, I tried, you know, but I just, I just couldn't do it, you know. So I, I came to the conclusion that I was just too happy <laughs> to do that. So it was a really good background, you know, for Larry singing the blues, you know, because, you know, he's going to try, but, you know, he just, he just can't do it. So I can't, I can't paint Expressionist and Larry can't sing the blues. The idea for Minnesota Cuke was based on a video game that Big Idea put out about a year ago or so. And then uh, one of our artists, Joe Spadiford, had the idea about what if he was searching for something like a hairbrush. And there, there are several stories in the Bible that, um, you know, we've come to several times as sort of iconic stories that we've wanted to tell. Minnesota Cuke worked really well because we were able to, you know, retell the story in the biblical account of Samson and, and hit the major points. Samson didn't recognize that his power came from God. He would say, I'm going to do this and I'll do that. And so it seemed like a perfect connection with the people being misinformed that the hairbrush might have power. It all came from God to begin with. The plot had been kind of laid for us. We just filled it in with a lot more gags. It just snowballed from there. <laughs> In a studio, I'm working with a bunch of guys who are artists, very artistic types. So unfortunately, these are the guys that in school were almost always picked on. All I'll say is that I ran away a lot as a kid. Third grade, walking home from school one day. I think it was in the fifth grade. We had this one kid who had us convinced that he knew karate. Just sort of a lot of noogies and, and that sort of thing. And these two big kids from the fifth grade, I run up behind me and smack, push me over in the ditch. Yeah, I think everybody deals with a bully at some point or other, you know, Eventually you're going to run into somebody who's bigger than you and 
who doesn't like it very much. Oh no! It's gone! Junior's toast! The stories themselves kind of deal with bullying from two directions. You know, one, you know, a child being bullied. You know, Minnesota Cuke, you know, the hero himself, you know, becomes a bully. I'll tell you what we're gonna do, Martin. I'm gonna get that brush first, and I'm gonna use its power to defeat all the bullies in the world. I think most stories uh, teach you to, to stand up to bullies and be ready to fight. And I didn't want to go that route. There's a proverb in the Old Testament even that says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Hopefully, eventually they'll come around and they won't be your enemy forever. You're right, Julia. Being mean back to a bully just makes me a bully too. There's actually a lot of emotion, you know, being carried by these vegetables. And so I felt comfortable adding a depth to the music also. Every kid needs a place to go think. And for Junior, it's his, his treehouse. I had a treehouse very similar to the one actually in, in Junior and the Bully story. It was a place for me to play and use my imagination and cultivate my imagination. It was definitely a place for me to, you know, find refuge and, and think through stuff. But you have to come down, you have to face your problems, but you can't, you don't do it alone. You have God's help. And, you know, you go to your parents and they'll, they'll help you through it. Hey, Figaro, can I find my best days? I used to go over and get my hair cut at this barbershop. All of the guys in the barbershop were Italian and that's all they would do, would just yell at each other all day. Why I want to use your razor, Leo? My razor suits me just fine. I'm just saying, I can't find my razor and you're the only other one here. Oh, Leo and Figaro, yeah, they're brothers. In fact, over the cash register, if you look, see a little picture of a carrot and a little bouffant hairdo? That's their mom, Mama Leone. Canadians! I love Canadians. I have relatives who are Canadian. Canadians are wonderful people. That's why at the end, they're the good guys. Nobody comes to the rescue better than the Royal Canadian Mounties, eh? My favorite pizza. You know, I like Canadian bacon and pineapple. Oh, pepperoni and sausage. Ham and pineapple. You know, I work for vegetables, so around here I eat mostly meat pizzas. Pizza ain't he's come to me. Tim had a great concept for the song great lyrics. Pizza Angel came out of my affinity for a lot of 50s music, and my favorite songs were always those tragedy songs. It wasn't until I brought John Troushton in to play a lot of guitar work on it that it really took on, oh yeah, that's the sound. The Pizza Angel, they're not real angels. Well, they're, they're Pizza Angel because they come and they, you know, they deliver. They're the messenger that comes and brings you the pizza, and so that's, that's where it came from. A chocolate malta. Malt. Right. Chocolate. My favorite type of malt? Straight chocolate. I like chocolate malt. I just like the regular chocolate malt. I have no idea why we made it strawberry ice cream in the malt shop. Isn't that every kid's fantasy just to have a swimming pool full of ice cream? So. And so what we have learned applies to our lives today. God has a lot to say in his book. The way that we teach lessons with stories and veggie tales is with the biblical worldview, the idea that there is a God who made us and who loves us and who wants to have a relationship with, with us. And when you assume that, you know, that influences, you know, how you look at the world and how you tell your stories. I want kids to walk away knowing they don't have to be scared of bullies. You treat other people the way you want to be treated. You bless those who curse you. It's really, really hard, but it brings a lot more inner peace and a lot more strength and that strength that, that comes from God. God doesn't want you to be afraid. He doesn't want you to be timid. And he doesn't want you to have to feel like you have to go hide. But he doesn't want you to become a bully either. And if we can relate that in Veggie Tales in a story that's, um, that's fun um, and that can engage kids and, and model for them biblical behavior, um, then you know, that's, that's what we really hope to do. And hopefully you know, kids will really learn from that. You know, I love to get into different things. I love doing different kinds of music, different kinds of projects, and I've enjoyed doing this this project. I've enjoyed it. It was a challenge, very much of a challenge to me. We're communicating with a lot of very, very young people, which a lot of our music does. We have fans that are, are very, very young. I had never described a cucumber before or thought of one as being a hero. But I got a picture with a whip on his shoulder and a hat on with this real mean look on his face. And he was like, yeah, 
Now, that I can get into. That I understand. So we kind of went on from there. Behind where I'm sitting is a studio that's set up for the Charlie Daniels band. We're always ready to record. We sit out in the room and communicate with each other. I say, here's an idea. That's how we create music. That's how we do music. That's how we make our records, our albums, and how we approach every project that we do is a melding of ideas. First thing you know, you got a track, and then you go put the vocal on it and mix it and send it to y'all. Veggie Tales, a lot, a lot of times what we'll do is create a parody with a lesson. And Lord of the Beans, the lesson is about using your gifts. So it was equally important, or more so, to actually have the, the main character learn something. It wasn't really even possible to say, let's parody the actual story from the Lord of the Rings. So it was more about, let's parody the characters, the settings, the world, the feel, and kind of that sense of mission. We all have had a lot of thoughts about you know, how to make this you know, as meaningful as possible. That still had the same kind of epic feel, um, but was all based around one theme of, I've got a gift, what am I supposed to do with it? So what would you like to do with your gift? Casting is really important, you know, what character you choose to play a role. When you can get the right character in the right role, things really click. I think everybody in Lord of the Beans was generally happy about the roles they got stuck with. Uh, Bob was on vacation in Pensacola, Florida. He surfs and he tries to avoid sharks. My precious! There's a part of Lunt that really connects with that role. It's not a stretch. I was running around the room while I was writing it, just screaming as Lunt, and, and all those lines came out. Naturally, you know, something like, you know, a spork is, is got to be a bad guy. We're not saying that utensils are the bad guys, but you have to admit that spork and orc are very close. And for a vegetable, what could be more terrifying than a eating utensil that's a combination of a spoon and a fork, or a spork? <gasps> they took the What Have We Learned song! I think really all we'll need is a batch of freshly baked cookies to coax the record away from the sporks. The script for Lord of the Beans called for a huge world, an epic world. We were very diligent to try to go no more than 10 sets for any given show. You know, in Lord of the Beans, when I first read that script, I counted like 19 sets. Each scene or each location had to have its own distinct feel. If it all looked fairly similar, you wouldn't get this feeling of, oh, well, they went, just went on this epic journey, you know, because it kind of looks the same as it did over there. We came up with some solutions by combining a bunch of sets. We reused a lot of sets in this show from other shows. For instance, we used, we reused the mountaintop set that was used in Minnesota Cuke. It's just kind of like having a backlot. I mean, movies do that all the time. All the major studios have backlots, and after they use uh, props and sets and things for shows. They, they store them and bring them out and dust them off and use them again. We do the same thing. With what Chuck Vollmer and Joe Spadaford did, um, going in, creating techniques for how to integrate um, you know, 2D and 3D to create this world that if we would have tried to build that all in 3D, would have just been so expensive and so prohibitive. A vicuna. Three ring binder. A vespa. An elephant. Oh, We'll come up to a, a point in the script where, you know, we'll just have ad lib, you know, and so we'll just spend five minutes in the booth just goofing off, you know, and then, you know, and a lot of times that's where we get our funniest stuff. Ad libbing is a part of writing too, you know, because you got to come up with a thought sometime. I had some fireworks for my daughter's birthday, shooting them off in the backyard for friends and family. And I'm standing right next to the, to the garage, and I had this one that I didn't know what it was going to do. So I light it, and all of a sudden it goes and starts spinning up in the air. So I dive into the garage and slam the door behind me. But it had followed me into the garage, and the lights are off, and I'm like stumbling through the garage, just waiting for is there going to be explosion or what? <laughs> Fortunately, there wasn't a, a large report. I had to jump out of a boat once to avoid the potential of getting my hair caught on fire. <laughs> I've caught some grass on fire before with fireworks. Never, never anybody's hair. Mike was also in that boat. 
You know, my job as a director is to protect the story. And what that means is, you know, if somebody uh, adds something to it, even if it's really good, but it detracts from the main flow of the story, then it's my job as a director to, to you know, pull back on that. But a lot of times, you know, an, anima an animator will get it and they'll see something completely new in it and they'll, they'll, they'll add to that and it'll really work. One of the great surprises in Lord of the Beans was sort of the, um, you know, Larry's mouth in the silly song, you know, just that kind of that Elvis snarl. If I was handsome, if I was nice. He's under this delusion that, you know, he's got this, you know, his baby elf that feels about him the same way that he feels about her, and it's just not true. We wanted to do sort of vintage Elvis, the earlier works that kind of had that rockabilly feel. To and when I heard that, I just kind of, you know, I was singing along with it, and then I heard that little thing, and then I just started vamping along with that. Coming out of Minnesota Cuke, uh, we had all this exciting music and a lot of action and adventure. There was so much emotion in this story and so much depth to it, and the music really carried a lot of that. And the more I was writing, the more I was getting wrapped up into it and really enjoying what I was doing. Irish music has this way of of being sad and happy all at the same time, and, and it just elicits that emotion. That sort of establishes the whole the whole show. And we hear that theme interweaved throughout, and even comes back in at the very end when the, the grass blooms and the trees blossom. Probably uh, one of the most dramatic little cues in the in the show is the Sporks theme. I had written that for the show and we kept pe pulling parts out of, out of it because we had to hear the dialogue and we had to see the action, which is understandable. That's what you have to do in a movie. So I just get my little 30 seconds in there at the end of the Sporks theme and then Winona sings. Just remember why he gave This was a real treat to be able to work with Winona and uh, co-produce with Brian. At first, when we heard the lyrics to this song, It's About Love, we thought, well, do we need to focus more on gifts? What goes beyond that? We're using our gifts because of the love. It's about love. It's 1 Corinthians 13. Every gift is given for a reason. We can't choose which ones we get, only what we do with them. That's one brave flobbit. There, there's more than just you know being a professional boxer to be, to be brave or a race car driver or doing something dangerous to get famous. That's not real courage. Okay, real courage is, is going out of your way for something that doesn't benefit you. It's, I think it's really um, important to not be alone in, in what you do, you know, to have the support of your friends and of your family and of your, of your community. And I think that's a great thing to see modeled in a film for kids is a group coming together, you know, and they weren't fighting for something on their own, they were fighting for Toto to help him so he can accomplish his quest. I hear you figured out what your gift is for. I thought I had, but the elders were lying. It was a trick. I think it's really important for us to help our kids learn what their gifts are for, how God intends us to use our gifts. And I can't wait because kids get so many messages from our culture about how you use your gifts. Every cover of every magazine that screams to them when you try to get them through the checkout line, you know, it's just screaming selfish ambition and vain conceit is what will make you happy. That's why this is an important story to tell, to instill in children from a young age that the gifts that have been given them are for them to use, to use for the benefit of others. The bean is a metaphor for, you know, whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is. Try to craft a story that could make selflessness appealing, which is tricky. It's easier if you show the consequences of being selfish, if you show people being selfish and not getting what they want. But then we show Junior, who actually sees the good that his gift can do for other people when he uses it the way God intended it at the end, and he's filled with joy. I think each of us has their own special talent and ability, and rather, use, rather than using that ability to help ourselves, to make ourselves rich or to make ourselves famous, what God wants for each of us is to use that ability to help somebody else. I want to help people. On my way to the studio today, I was thinking about what can I possibly say 
as a believer, as a mother, as a singer, that basically says how I feel about this product. I believe very strongly that so much of music today, the lyrics are getting kind of out there. The most important thing are, are giving our kids the positive influence to, to counterbalance the negative. But if we do it in a way that's, that's entertaining to the children, that is hip to them, that they'll actually like and listen to, and they might even learn something. Yes. Not only am I able to connect with the children, but the adults as well. It's not only upbeat and entertaining, but of course it has a message. I can honestly say it's something that I can um, enjoy performing. When I do these projects, three or four year old walks up to me and says, you know, why own it? And they know who I am and they know the song. Um, that's like the added bonus at this point in my career. What we do sometimes with stories is we'll, we'll actually take ideas from around the company. And one came out um, a number of years ago for a, um, a, a show called Sherlock Holmes. We really wanted to tell a story about friendship and felt like you know, using that dynamic of Sherlock and, and Bob would be you know, a, great, a great way to, to, to teach friendship. It's been a while since Bob and Larry have been on the screen together. You know, they, in fact, there's not very many shows that the roles really are suitable for Bob and Larry together, that just, you know, that, that chemistry is particular and, and it doesn't fit every story that we do, but this is one that it did. It can only mean that this is a lot harder than it looks. Anytime you do a mystery, there's, there's more dimension to it than a typical story uh, because you've got to also have some sort of, whether it's a crime or just some little something that's a mystery has got to be woven in at the same time while we're trying to teach you know, a lesson. Come back and fight like a, a pea! The story of Don Quixote is actually a story that I've wanted to do since we started Veggie Tales. When we figured out, okay, we're gonna do a story on friendship and Sherlock is gonna be, you know, the main title, it made a lot of sense to do, you know, the, the Don Quixote type story, you know, also as a friendship, you know, as a, as a companion. Started talking to Bob Lee about it and he actually came up with the idea of the asparagus of La Mancha. I, for many years, caught on that you know idea of Bob Quixote just because I like the sound of it. But as it turned out, it worked out much better doing it this way. We've been doing a lot of fairly complex shows, uh, and you know, every once in a while, it's nice to step back and do a show that has a fairly simple, you know, approach visually. We wanted to make sure that you know the dream world that Don went into looked very much different than his than the real world. You know pulling this both the Spanish flavor and this just really weird you know feeling in this world and just a great contrast to that you know waking up from that dream into his real world of the kitchen no cows still mooing in the hail Caesar hold the bird I don't know what most of them mean oh the diner talk but I honestly didn't catch one of them it seems like it should be shorthand you know like a way to say it faster Noah's boy on bread which is a ham sandwich you know it's just as long to say Noah Noah's boy on bread you know and frog sticks french fries I learned a lot of diner talking you know working with the show yikes what's in this stuff it's really quite hot it's a habanero it's got to be habanero I think those are the hottest peppers known to man we're not sure exactly Spicy food really isn't a part of Spanish, you know, cuisine. I just want everybody to know that we know that. So, you know, it's more of kind of taken on more of a Tex-Mex flavor, <laughs> so. It was nice having this Spanish twist to the music. It uh, brought something new to the table. <laughs> Being able to use like, you know, you know, kind of that that traditional Spanish sound and that flamenco guitar and then, you know, with the singer over top of that. By the way, if Mike's wearing a similar shirt to me, it's because he called me, I didn't call him. But I love how these uh, mysterious elements in the dream come together and just create this fanciful world of, of his dreamscapes. I always want to talk about checkers when we get to Asparagus La Mancha because I learned something through the course of making this show. Most of the people working on the show do not know how to play checkers. Look at the board. It's not even close to set up. 
<laughs> checkers, you play only on one color. You only play on, on the black squares. What if we turned the Sherlock Holmes thing on its ear? And what if what if Watson was really, you know, the one always solving the cases, you know, but Sherlock was always taking the credit for it? Yeah, we've been to London a few times, yeah, and we always love going back to London. I mean, we've been there for Dr. Jiggle, we've been there for, um, you know, the Easter special and the Christmas special, and, and back again for Sherlock. The golden rule is doing to others as you'd have them do unto you. We put that into a little metaphor, the actual golden ruler, you know, which was this artifact that they were looking for. But the reason it was so treasured is because of the advice that's inscribed on it. I really like the alley scene between, um, you know, Sherlock and Watson. Sherlock is beginning to get um, that, or he's hurting Watson's feelings, and it's beginning to dawn on him, and then he's interrupted again by, you know, these fans coming in, so he kind of reverts back to his old ways. This episode, both Sherlock and Asparagus of La Mancha took on a much more intimate flavor. Even more so in Sherlock, it all revolved around a solo violin and a pianist. We wanted to kind of get that kind of sad, kind of spooky, you know, violin sound. Whenever you can add a live instrument to, um, you know, a sequenced bed, you know, it, it makes it feel like, you know, the whole the whole band is is a live orchestra, a live band. Oh, well, we just had a P casting call. I just think it's funny that, you know, guarding Buckingham Palace is a bunch of French peas. Well, you had to have a strong neck to be able to hold that hat up. Ooh, I had a bad experience with brie cheese. I thought brie cheese was like moldy or something. When we wrapped the show in Toronto, um, we actually did, you know, brie cheese and baguettes for the crew, and it was really, really good brie cheese. To the gated community. That whole song idea kind of came up when you know, we were moving and you know, looking for houses and we saw all these different types of housing communities. And well, I like, to, I like to give Mike a hard time that it's about where he lives. <laughs> there he is! <laughs> you know, we went into this one gated community and it had a, you gotta go past the guard. On each house there's like a security, you know, uh, company, you know, sign. And then, what's more, you know, there's like a guy driving around making sure everything's okay. <laughs> you know, so it's just like, what are you afraid of? What's gonna happen here? So it's kind of just a, like, a, just a fun s satirical poke, you know, did a similar thing with the sport utility vehicles. Well, our first criteria was that our guest artists have to have the initials MW. So we were only able to find Matthew Ward and Matthew West. It was really fun working with real singers <laughs> on stuff because you know we have our vegetable voices and we go in and you know we can get by singing as vegetables. You know Matthew West, he's got a neat story. I really appreciate the hard work he's put into learning to be a, a better songwriter, uh, you know, a performer, and I, I really admire his work. You know, bringing back vocal elements that he doesn't usually use on a contemporary Christian album these days. Matthew Ward was a real treat. I grew up uh, listening and going to see concerts by the second chapter of Acts. And of course, he was the one of the vocalists in there, he and his two sisters. And so it's kind of always been a, a dream of mine. Boy, it'd be great to somehow work with Matthew one of these days. He couldn't have been more tickled to be able to do it for us. What are you doing? I'm doing this for your own good, Don. I need to stick by you and do what's best for you in your time of need. You know, I think it's a great episode for kids to learn how to be a good friend. You know, in Sherlock it's, um, you know, treating your friend like you want to be treated. And then in, in Asparagus of La Mancha, it's being loyal and, and, you know, looking out for your friend and doing what's best for them. Does he stick with this friend that everybody else is kind of mocking at this point and go join these other people, or does he stick with the friend that, you know, that, that he's had? But then also kind of that tough love of friendship where, you know, Don is, you know, hurting himself by, you know, his habit of eating hot spicy salsa before he goes to bed every night. Poncho actually, you know, leaves Don in jail, you know, without his salsa. He sort of is his tough love friendship and which ends up really, you know, being a great thing for Don. If you want somebody to be a good friend to you, you need to know how to be a friend to them. You know, be willing to share a toy, be willing to share some food, you know, everything not, not yours or mine or about me. Larry as Sherlock is taking the credit for, for, you know, all these cases and he's getting all the accolades and everybody's cheering for him as the great guy and Bob's, you know, as Watson is getting left out. Um, you know, and that's, that's Sherlock's big aha, you know, when he realizes that, wow, you know, 
Trout stole my idea, and I wouldn't like that if somebody did that to me. Um, so he sees, you know, that, that he's been treating Bob that way. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17, 17. Bob and Larry, um, you know, on the countertop, as they get this letter from Erica Bangaman, she asks, you know, what can I do to make friends? And, you know, and the answer is, well, the best way, you know, to, to make friends is to be a friend and, and really, you know, to, to be kind and, and compassionate and care about what others think and, and to be loyal. So I think that's a, it's a great lesson to learn uh, for kids to make friends. Well, we had the story of Gideon, and musical instruments are a major part of this story. So it's only a natural thing that if they're going to play something, let's, let's do a marching band. We started with this simple concept of tubas and flashlights. They're carrying around tubas and carrying around flashlights. I thought it was kind of weird and kind of uh, strange, and then I remembered that what makes our best shows the best shows are that we do weird things. It was a wonderful story, a Bible story, that you know, all of us around the development table remembered from our childhoods and really wanted to tell the story. Prepare to be boarded! Of us, ye regular hosts! We're pirate in this broadcast! Well, the pirates have hopped onto the countertop to take over the show because they've never had a chance to take over the show. And, you know, Jimmy and Jerry have done it and the French Peas have done it, but the pirates have never taken over the show before. You know, bringing the pirates on and kind of setting it up to do a little pirate movie promotional. I wrote the countertop with the pirates in it and just had a lot of fun with it. And you know, they, they did well on the countertop. Hilarious stuff. The uh, I think the Antsies in my pantsies is one of our best lines ever. Antsies in me pantsies. <laughs> it's just absurd. Having um, you know Gideon be a warrior and being you know being in a warrior marching band and his brothers being football players. There's just a lot of really neat things that kind of came together that that gave it a lot of fun. Good job, brothers! <laughs> hey! Ha ha! Yeah, that's real funny, guys! I was a sports guy, although I didn't play football in high school. My mom wouldn't let me. But then once I got to college, um, I got to play football. In junior high, actually, I was in the, I was in the band. So I was definitely a little more of the, the band person than the sports person. I was a sports guy, so, you know, I was, I was listening to the band. Well, I was a band geek. Definitely the band geek side of things. I was an art guy. I was in the chorus and the, the art, uh, art classes and that kind of thing. Uh, well, who else can sing around here? Every time we do a show, you know, the casting is one of the more interesting things that we go through, just kind of sorting through who's the right person to play that character. Paul feels a little bit more like Clarence in It's a Wonderful Life if, as he comes down, so, um, but with a, a little bit more moxie. I think Pa works really well as the angel, uh, just because he's really short and Larry's really tall, and that's always really funny. How musical is Larry? Well, he plays the tuba, so you, I mean, you got to be partly musical there to just pick up the thing and blow on it. There's hardly an instrument more funny than a tuba. <laughs> the lamps became flashlights, and instead of the the jars that they had to break and make all the noise, we turned that into the drum line. What's it going to sound like? if a bunch of flashlights are hitting the rocks. So I kind of started with just this little cadence. Little, oh, I didn't think of it. the Lord and a pity Well, if Gideon didn't trust God, you know, Israel would have been defeated. You know, God had a plan uh, to save Israel from the Midianites. And, um, you know, he chose to use Gideon to help him in that plan. And so I think, um, we have the decision whether we're going to act in the position that God puts us in. Such a wonderful lesson about putting everything you have, your trust in God, knowing that there's no way on earth I could do this by myself. That was real nice. It was touching yet lighthearted. I was moved. This was an interesting silly song because it kind of came out of Tim Hodge's mouth, the concept and the idea, and he's always Got a ukulele sitting around playing it. Haven't you heard of the Turtle Tubies? Very popular show all over television. Oh, turtle. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, guys, I don't think this is right. It doesn't make any sense. It works for us. I say ukulele. I had never heard it said ukulele. You know, I say ukulele because I say it wrong. Uh, ukulele, but I know that that's not correct. The Hawaiian correct pronunciation is ukulele. 
Put a little apostrophe in front of the U for that sound. Ukulele. Ukulele. Jumping flea. Wait a minute. I just thought of something. What if we tell Rachel a story? <laughs> that might help. That's worked in the past. We were looking for a companion piece for Gideon, another story that was going to demonstrate what it meant to have trust in God. Well, George Mueller came up as, as seemingly one that, that, you know, his life was sort of about an exercise in trusting God. You know. He believed that if I prayed for something and I had faith that it happened and, you know, I was doing the right thing, then God will provide my needs. And he actually kept a journal that, you know, if he prayed for something on Monday, he would record it later when, that, when the prayer was answered. He wanted to prove to the world God does answer prayer. Look, maybe I can run out and... Uh, Mr. Mueller? I, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast, and the Lord wanted me to send you some. We chose to use His Eyes on the Sparrow as, as a hymn in that, you know, that the kids are singing. And I think it's just, a, it's such a great song, uh, and, and I think it really, that gets across the idea that I think would be great to come across to kids, just this idea that God cares for us so much that we don't need to worry. He just trusted God to meet their needs every single day, and every single day, God did. A time in my life when I had to trust God was when my daughter was in the hospital, and during that time she got sick. Uh, twice actually and we realized that even though we had to trust God there was no promise that she was going to be okay the only promise was that God would take care of us. And Gideon says I thought God was just going to tell me well done and the angel has that great line it's my favorite line in the whole show he said if you want to hear God say well done you've got to do what he asks. The core is, is finding out what it is God wants for you you know what he wants for you, it's a lot easier to separate what you need and what you want. God has a plan and you know we're called by him um, into that plan to be to be to be used. And so uh, we just need to trust that God is in control, God knows what he's doing, and then it's our job to obey um, and, and to do what he asks us to do. When we read the script, we had this new character of the narrator. Now, some matches are made in phosphorus factories, while others are made in heaven. <laughs> Either way, it all starts with a little chemistry. We had Mike Naraki record the part of the narrator, and he did a great job. It was really terrific, but it always kind of sounded like somebody trying to sound like a cowboy. Now, some matches are made in phosphorus factories, while others are made in heaven. Either way, it all starts with a little chemistry. Meanwhile, I had heard about these uh, Bar J Wranglers out of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which had been started by Babe Humphrey. Well, first of all, gosh, we've been working on these songs for like years now, literally. Um, I wanted it to have a really timeless and sincere quality. And so we had a, a whole quartet already composed and sung and mixed and everything. And then Brian, said, hey, can we bring Babe in? <laughs> he basically has, uh, was one of the founders of the chuck wagon movement out west. We try to entertain mom and dad, the kids, uh, with, some, uh, with an experience of the real west. And we're all like, wow, it's a real singing cowboy. <laughs> and our show is based around cowboy humor, cowboy poetry, harmony singing, uh, you're on a working ranch and compare the meal as to what you might have had had you been on an actual cattle drive in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and we serve out of a tin plate and a tin cup, and, and it's a cowboy experience. <laughs> when I heard his answering machine, I knew that he had the part because it was something like, uh, oh, you've reached Babe and Martha. We can't come to the phone right now. We're out doing chores or something. They'll leave a message and we'll get back to you. And it just, it was just like, oh, that's it. That's the exactly what I'm looking for. I had heard of VeggieTales, but not a lot until I mentioned it to my grandkids. And every one of them knew VeggieTales. I sat there and got tickled. I read the script on this one that we're doing on the plane coming in, and I was really up to giggling. People around me were asking, what are you laughing at? I said, well, you got to read these scripts, you know. Hey, any luck today? I found a baby! Oh, that's nice. 
What? You tell the stories, you try to explain the Bible, and it's kind of, it's hard for them to conceive. And you take those Bible stories and you put them into a unique setting and a delivery system that you've got them locked. Those kids love it and they're getting the message. Babe was the real deal. Babe really made all the songs his own. But it also changed the key to everything. Everything dropped about three steps because Babe's got this, Mike's got this voice up here and Babe's got this voice down here. It took some work for me to try to get them like they should be. <laughs> I'm sure the producers all had, had to have a lot of patience. But he was bringing such a unique voice and flavor to it, such an authenticity, which is what we hired him for. Oh, lone stranger. No matter what he did, it just sounded great. Kind of a nice thing to have when you're going down the trail of life. You know, to look back, the kids will have that. It's been a real uh, honor to be involved in this episode. It's got a great Christian message, and uh, all of them, the way they relate that, it's just an uh, honor to be part of that. It really is. Phil had this great idea to tell the parable of the prodigal son as a parody of the Wizard of Oz. Something Phil is really good at is finding a carrier, um, a, a world or a, or a context that can carry a really important story so kids can get it. What I set out to do wasn't to tell the story of the Wizard of Oz, but was actually tell the story of the prodigal son. And that's where it started, which is you know, probably one of the two or three most powerful stories in the Bible. Um, but we hadn't told it for kids because, number one, it's, it's not all that fun for a kid, and number two, it's really, really short. And that's when it occurred to me that the structure for the parable of the prodigal son was almost identical to the structure of, of Frank L. Baum's classic, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz! There it is! The land of Oz. Funnest place on earth! It'd be really easy to get lost in The Wizard of Oz because it's a lot of fun and there's a lot of places to visit. But we are telling the story of the prodigal son. We are telling the story that is Darby's story about going away and then coming back home. My favorite part of the film is the ending. The shots where dad sees Darby approaching and the look on his face. And then as Darby's walking up the street, we see dad just running towards him with this reckless abandon. I think it's really meaningful and really special to see the way that the father reacts and to think that, that that's the same way that God looks at us when we come back to him. My son, don't just stand there. Get a cake, get ice cream. Go rent one of those big bouncy castles. We're gonna have a party. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, okay. So in the original Wizard of Oz, it was set in the real world. Dust Bowl era, sepia tone, black and white, you know. And so in ours, it's a VeggieTales version of that same kind of thing. And in, instead, in CG and in um, brightly colored CG, bleaching it out to black and white is not gonna be very entertaining. But we kind of made it somewhere in between to me, the importance of the floss and the bathroom tissue and all that, I think it just sets our world up to be one of farce and silliness and, and real fantasy. You, you gotta make sure the floss is ripe before picking it, or it's, it's just um, real bitter. I worked some elements like that, kind of bizarre fantasy elements, even into the real world, for no philosophical reason, mostly just because I thought it was funny. What is it, boy? Tornado! Growing up in Colorado, there's not many tornadoes. Then I moved to Oklahoma. Tornadoes are really frightening. Very, very scary. I had to hide in my grandparents' basement once when a tornado came through Muscatine, Iowa. What was important to me uh, and to our art director, Joe Spatterford, is that the, the tornado felt really cartoony. <laughs> When we've got this twister coming, we needed some intense music, but at the same time, we don't want to get too intense, and we want to keep some of that Hollywood magic to it. So it's got some of the old-fashioned string runs, just those sorts of things that help to convey the, the seriousness of this, but at the same time, it's, it's not uh, so overly dramatic. Every song in the show is fantastic. 
Um, the Ha 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 song in the park is absolutely my favorite. We kept writing that, and as we would get to the end, the director would keep saying, oh, let's make it a little faster. Let's, let's get it even faster, even faster at the end, to the point that we, we could barely sing it in laying down the, the, the tracks to record to it. I was like, whoa, that's <laughs> just about impossible. Again! <laughs> Bill came in with the script. He had some real clear ideas for some of the songs. And um, some of them sounded uh, like Wizard of Oz songs, some of them didn't. And we were trying to find that mix of, okay, we want to make it f be a parody of Wizard of Oz, but we want to tell our own story also. Look, there he goes! Five lords, yellow mixed lord, happily hopping his way down the road. Five lords, yellow mixed lord, down to the land of Oz. And in case you didn't get that, it's yellow mctoad, which happens to rhyme with yellow brick road, but totally different thing. Mike said, well, we can't just follow Yellow Brick Road. We need to do something silly there. And so he kind of figured out what sounded like Yellow Brick Road and ended up with Yellow McToad. Uh, and then our concept artist, Chuck Vollmer, got a hold of the character and turned him into the kilt-wearing Scottish uh, old toad that we see today. In the old film, Wizard of Oz, those, those people went through some terrible times and the, the, the makeup they would react to in their face. But, you know, uh, Lunt, Larry, and Pa had it pretty easy. Pa Grape had to come in like at five o'clock in the afternoon, two days before he was supposed to shoot, uh, to get flocked. Uh, Lunt actually enjoyed the burlap. He thought it was a good look for him. And what about you, sir? Well, I just, I just want to do whatever I want. It was great to, for me as a director to get to work with Lisa. She brings an incredible sweetness and genuineness to Darby or to Junior. Uh, whenever she performs him, for example, uh, when Darby says in, in Wizard of Oz, what seems to be the problem? Um, that line could be delivered kind of in a really flat way, but when, as she was uh, in the booth, it, it made me think about way back on um, Are You My Neighbor? when Junior gets to the spaceship and he says, what seems to be the problem? What seems to be the problem? The problem, as you can see. I'm just thrilled with what his character is like, you know, he's got this charm and he's really, you know, you really root for him. Even all the while, while he's kind of being a little bit whiny and, you know, kind of going off and, and really being a kind of a bad character, you know, he's doing some really bad things. And ultimately, you know, w what Lisa brought to it is this real charm, you know, that you just go with him, you're like, oh, buddy, don't do that, you know. Hurry up, boy. Tarnation, Tutu. You must be the slowest dog in Kansas. Is Tutu a dog or is he a pig? That's um, one of those big, you know, life, life questions. Does, does the dog appear as a pig to us or does the pig behave as a dog for the people in the story? We're going to let you decide that. Kids, you choose. Pig, dog, it's either way. So during the production of Wizard of Oz, Mike Naraki has been away directing the Pirates Who Don't Do Anything, the VeggieTales movie, and yet we found ourselves in need of a silly song. Meanwhile, our producer Chris Wall had been given a children's CD called Slugs and Bugs and Lullabies by a couple of uh, Christian recording artists here in Nashville, Andrew Peterson and Randall Goodgame. I said, Brian, these guys are really funny. Um, we should think about maybe see if we can call them up and, and do some silly songs. And so they came in with two songs and played one of them, and it was Monkey. I thought the song was really cute, you know, and I was following along. And then there's this turn in the song, because at first you think Bob doesn't get it. And then you realize that Larry's the one that's off. <laughs> we laughed hard. And we said, that's it, that's the new Silly Song. Really, it's, it's, it's semi-revolutionary. I think we're putting some new ideas into kids' minds for ways to classify life. If there's a tail, it's a monkey. No tail, ape. It's easy. And that simplifies life so much, and that's what people are looking for today, a simplicity to life that we lost, I think, in the 60s. But now we have it back. Larry, this is a disaster. <laughs> it's a monkey. We realized that you can't really do a parody of The Wizard of Oz or, or a tribute to The Wizard of Oz, which is really what I think this show kind of ends up being, without having Over the Rainbow. So the producer of the film calls me up and says, we're gonna use uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow under the closing credits. We felt like, man, it'd be really great to get that song in there, you know, it's a really fun song. I think it'd be funny if we do it just the way it is and just have Mr. Lunt sing it, because nobody can do Judy Garland like Mr. Lunt. Somewhere over 
over the rainbow. Skies are blue. Skies are blue. And the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. <laughs> he's right. You know, I think he's got a shot at stardom with that tune. I think it'll become his. Um, if you can get past the, the cracked notes and the mistakes and the straining. Tell my mom I'll be right here. It'd be easy in this story to get stuck in telling this really important story and lose the fact that we need to be having fun the whole time we're doing it. I think when VeggieTales is at its best, we speak to the whole family, and I believe that this show really does that. And I, I hope that uh, families are able to use this story as, as, as a way to teach a lesson in their own home and have fun. Uh, along the journey. It's time to see the wizard, the whimsical wizard of Oz. With wounded and rides and games galore, you'll have some fun to want some more. It's time to see the wizard, the whimsical wizard of Oz. Ow. We've wanted to tell the prodigal son story for a long time, but have just had before now had never really found the right vehicle to tell it through. Uh, so we were excited to be able to finally get that lesson and that nugget out there for people. Things will happen where you will think, oh wow, that's the worst thing I've ever done. Does God still love me? You know, will my parents still accept me? Can I come home? Can I come back to God after doing something like that? Junior leaving his dad, Darby leaving his father and saying, no, I want to go out and try it on my own and realizing he can't and will, will my dad ever take me back? And, you know, that's, a, that's an underlying fear or question, I think, for a lot of us. I did something wrong. Will I still be loved? Will I still be accepted? Can I be forgiven? Not only by our earthly family, but obviously by our God. And uh, that's the importance of this story, is that, yes, he always accepts us back with open arms. One of the things that Veggie House has always been about, that Phil and Mike first set out to do, is to say, in a world that doesn't believe this, God made you special and he loves you very much. And we've talked a lot about how kids are made special and this story focuses on and he loves you very much, you know, really in its essence. Because it's saying that there's a God who loves you no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, he will always take you back. We really want to instill in kids before they hit that point, before you do that first thing that really makes you question whether you can be forgiven. Um, that there is no limit to God's love, that his ability to forgive us and to accept us and to love us is infinite. And if we can get that into kids when they're four or five, you know, by the time they're 10 or 11 or 12 or 16 or 18, you know, and actually doing the things or having the experiences that make them doubt, they'll be set. Now I'm so Four main characters in the movie are all pursuing what they want most, which in this is, is fun or food, it's, it's pleasure, it's really the pursuit of a life of pleasure, which in our culture today is, is what probably eight out of ten Americans are pursuing. The more you get into it though, pursuing pleasure almost never results in what we really want, which is peace and joy, you know, fruit, fruit of the spirit, which comes from a pursuit of God not a pursuit of pleasure. So it's, it, even though it's not the main storyline of The Wizard of Haas, it's a very significant subtext. We absolutely don't have anything to say against theme parks by any means. It's not the park that was the bad thing, it was what he did to get there. You know, I think that um, the Bible and God is so full of timing. You know, he says a lot about this is the time, there's a season and a time for everything. Much like the prodigal son story, it wasn't that him taking it as inheritance was bad. That's what an inheritance is, you take it right? He took it at the wrong time. He got selfish and decided this was the time to do it. I'm going to go do this thing for myself and he took off with it. Fun is not bad in small doses. Uh, changing your life so that it is organized around the pursuit of fun is a really unhealthy way to live. The idea of telling Huckleberry Finn as uh, sort of a, a veggie tale story has always been really intriguing to me because it just has such a great lesson about helping others. Um, the challenge with the story was to make it appropriate, it just has a lot of heavy topics. 
you know, slavery and abuse. But the lesson that came out of it, and Huckleberry Finn, um, you know, wanting to do the right thing, even when you have to go beyond, uh, beyond yourself and do the right thing. You know, Huckleberry Finn is basically just going down the river and crazy things happening along the way. It's based on a book. <laughs> this story really shows us what it takes for you to do the hard thing when it takes something extra and you've got to kind of make a sacrifice. And I think what kids take away from this is his sacrifice of his friend. The core of the story is right there, you know, that moment. Goodbye, Huckleberry Larry. Goodbye, Tomato Sawyer. I'm sorry, Huck. And I think that it's a lesson that, that both kids and adults can apply kind of on a small scale, you know, in their house when mom and dad need help, just taking out the garbage. Uh, but it's also something that happens on a large scale. Uh, when you see something, you know, on a world level, sometimes you think, man, I'm just a kid, there's nothing I can do. But the truth is uh, that, that very often there is something that you can do. And if we look for those opportunities to help people uh, on, a, on a little scale and on a big scale, uh, then, then that's ultimately what God wants us to be doing. It's always easier to, to say, someone else can do this. This has nothing to do with me. I thought you couldn't get involved. Well, that's just it. When you see that someone needs help and you know you can help them, you just have to get involved. We want to take more responsibility for the world we live in. You know, we want to take more responsibility for the people who live down the street from us. And I hope that that rings true and that kids are able to walk away saying, okay, I have seen that modeled for me and what it takes to do that, and I think I can do that myself. You forgot about your good friend, Tomato. And your lucky fishing pole. I'm sorry, Huck. You were right all along. We do need to help others, even when it's not easy. I forgive you, Tom. What we've all tried to do at VeggieTales is tell stories that help kids and help families. Um, and, and, you know, I like to feel like, or I, I like to think that I'm using my gifts that God has given me to, to help others. And we try to tell stories that help parents pass on biblical values to their kids. The obligation of being his hands and feet on earth, of showing his love uh, to everyone who needs it. And if we can help teach that to kids, uh, you know, not in a duty way, but in a, you know, look at what we can do. God has given us the ability to help, and we find our joy when we're helping. So don't just sit on the couch, don't just watch TV. If you see someone that needs help, one of your friends needs help, even if someone else could do it, someone else could is closer, oh, just go help them. Just be the one, be the one that helps. That's what God wants from us. It's really a story about faith. It's a story about doing the right thing. It's a story about just following God. And there are a number of topics that we want to teach about that are pretty varied in how you can teach them. Patience is one of those, which you can teach from the side of waiting or the side of um, being patient and being diligent. Now, Abe and Sarah is a, a classic story from the Old Testament. The story of having to wait so, so long to, to have a child and they learn to trust him and have to put their faith in him and be patient. Both of these stories went through a ton of different versions and, and several scripts, and so it was actually an exercise in patience in development to make this show in, in patience. You know, we really wrestled with how much of this great big story do you try to get in one little story like this. It's really hard for kids and even for us as adults to just wait for something. For example, Junior, he wants to kind of like get it done, get it done quick and go back to eat the cookies. So that's how patience paid off. The end. Okay, let's go home, Bob. Cookies await. I like my cookies with a light flaky kind of a crust, you know, kind of a sugar cookie or something. So that's what I'm imagining. And when cookies are sitting out, it's hard to not eat the cookies. Hot, warm cookies are just oh, the best. And so we thought it'd be fun to have Junior chasing after cookies. Chocolate chip, man, that's, that's the way to go. That's my favorite, and I'm a big fan. I can practically taste those chocolate chips now. So for fans of the series that know VeggieTales well, they'll know that there was a Ma Grape at one time. She has a little bit of, you know, a range. She is that motherly figure that's kind and, and supportive. The best part about the new character was we needed a new voice, and this time we got to use uh, the voice of Delilah. When waiting got hard, it helped me to think about how wonderful it would be when we got our promise. 
Originally, the boo-boo bird wasn't part of the story. Well, well, I was actually in the, my backyard and just seeing birds coming in and, and just uh, eating some sunflower seeds. It's like, oh, what about if there is a bird that eats sunflower seeds and that bird kind of like, it was the pride and, and, and tradition of Boobooville. We just thought it'd be funny, kind of a cute little way to set up, you know, what this town is about. So we created the Boo Bird, which was really fun because it needed to be really goofy looking <laughs> to match the name Boo Boo Bird. I mean, you know, you can't have a normal looking bird. We love it in her, we love it in her. Hey, it's really, really nice in her. Er is is the, the place to be. The biblical account talks about Ur was a place that Abraham was fairly settled and he liked it there. You know, he didn't want to move on. So we thought about Ur and like, what would be appealing about it? And we said, well, actually, what if it's a re little retirement community? And so it became this, we knew exactly where to go then. There's plenty of refreshments and lots of fun. Who doesn't like it in Ur? Just give me one person. This show is actually the first full 45 minute VeggieTales show for John Waba to direct and he did a fantastic job. I'm thrilled with how much he's brought to the screen, and he really wrestled with it. You know, I love it when the directors get in there and through production just really wrestle with it to make it better, um, and he did. There's some great moments in the film that would not exist without John having really worked at it. Nifty. Sneeze if you have to. Sneeze if you need to. Some of the great Chile songs are ones that talk about things that everybody's experienced, you know, losing a hairbrush, uh, love of cheeseburgers, and now we have a song about sneezing. We went back with our friends Randall Goodgame and Andrew Peterson, who had written Monkey and also The Biscuit of Zazamarandabo, uh, and they pitched this song for Sneeze. Right from the top, we all said, boy, that chorus is just really catchy. But we were looking for what was the thing that we could tweak it to make it really just like, bah -ha, you know? And so John Waba threw out the idea, well, what if Bob, once he starts sneezing, can't stop? I didn't want Bob to be like, okay, Bob can't sneeze, he goes to the doctor, he sneezes, end of story. I wanted actually to create a bigger payoff at the end. As part of production, we always work very hard to finish out the whole show, which includes the DVDs. And one of the things we never really talk about is what it takes to make our great DVDs. And we've brought along a new producer, Zach Willis, to help us get that wrangled and put together in an amazingly fast time frame. The writer of both of these stories is Mark Steele. Uh, he's a new writer for us, and um, he came in uh, as a script writer and then also came in uh, and presented some songs. He won't ever get it right unless it's right right now. It's just it's a big number that's filled with a lot of fun moments. We needed a big opener that, that kind of set in motion this bit of a Beauty and the Beast feeling kind of world, you know, where it's uh, high energy and lots of fun. That was a really fun thing to be able to capture these songs that really try to sing about patience or right, right now, having to do something right now. It, it was a great way to, to take a song and within the song make it sound like somebody's impatient. If you're gonna do a story about inventions and all kinds of fun little bits, you kind of have to capture that in the song. And so Humding for We really does that. He's just like a little kid in, in a big toy store. I loved singing it as, as Larry. I mean, that was just a blast. If I look around, I would see there's more important things than what I create. And I'd learn to wait and enjoy the joys that life will bring. The other songs are more for like comic reliefs and, and just introducing characters and introducing inventions. This song is strictly about the lesson. Amidst all of the silliness, there's just a really powerful lyric here that applies to all of us. I am willing to wait. My work will be great. With patience, I'll do things right. I think that right there sums up the whole story that we've been telling. With patience, we'll do things right. What we're trying to teach the kids is if we trust God or if we trust mom and dad, it's easier to wait for the promise to be fulfilled. You know, we may expect things to happen right now or tomorrow, uh, and, and Abe needed to realize, and, and we also need to realize that, that it's in God's time. So it's not going to always be how we think it's going to be when we think it's going to be. Something we felt was just so important to communicate to kids is when God promises something to you, He will do it. 
We live uh, in an age where we expect things to happen very quickly. So waiting is a big challenge for us. And for, for us here, a big idea to have an opportunity to talk about waiting and to teach kids about waiting and, and to have impact in that sense. It's, it's a great opportunity. Are you ready for your cookies now, Junior? What? Already? Oh boy, cookies, here I come! Hi and welcome to this DVD's art gallery where we show the concept art that went into the film. Today with me, Joe Spatterford, is Mike Naraki, the voice of Larry the Cucumber. Hello, Joe. Hi. Let's uh, let's get right to it. All right. I, I wish to... I was as thin as that picture right now. <laughs> well, it's your very square jawed though. That's very nice. <laughs> so, oh look, there's some artwork right there. Yeah, we started off uh, like like last time. Uh, Petunia or uh, Julia in this film uh, made a special appearance, and she's uh, Cuke's co-star. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, and uh, it's a lovely uh, senorita dress you have her in for her Mexican ice cream. But we had, uh, you know, costume changes in this film because, as you know, Minnesota Cuke travels around the world. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in Turkey, it's quite cold sometimes. Especially uh, Mount Ararat up at that high elevation. At the high elevation, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to give her a breathing apparatus, but that uh, that just didn't work out. An it iron lung. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, look at that. There's Larry the Cucumber. Mike actually flying. has a wig like this at home, <laughs> and he wears it every night, I'm told. No, I do, although I do have a Napoleon Dynamite wig. We, we redid the first couple of scenes working with Todd Carter. Uh, we just thought it'd be funny. The goal was to have Cuke be humiliated at the end of this experience. Um, yeah. And so, you know, what better way to be humiliated than be dressed up in a dress and a wig? Yeah, dressed so. in your, your grandma's nightgown and, and yeah. a clown wig. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Now, how often is it that you get to see Bob and Larry as kids? Yeah, they're veggie babies. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's tooth, as he was drawn in concept there, when it came to reality, when they when they actually built it in 3D, as Larry would talk, his mouth would just be full of white. <laughs> so, so That was his, his baby tooth. <laughs> yeah, that was his baby tooth. So we had to reduce it. So when you see it in actuality, it will be a little bit smaller, but it's awfully cute in his wide mouth smile like that. Okay, the potato guards, we, uh, you know, we were trying to think for a long time as to, like, what could be a big guard, you know, what could be, uh, what could be the vegetable that, that we've used. And we thought back to the past of uh, potato from uh, uh, Sumo the Opera, and uh, we, we just put some angry eyebrows on, on him, and uh, he just looks like a big, beefy bouncer guy, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, you just don't want to mess with. Warren Muffet in the script was described as kind of a crazy... Old eccentric. Eccentric. Eccentric okay. is yeah. loopy with money. He wrote the poem uh, that made him famous and that made his fortune, the Little Miss Muffet poem. Oh, the little, little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet eating a curds and whey. So that's where he made his money. Yeah, we, we tried to, to, to make him look a little eccentric by giving him some kind of wacky hair and a big uh, bow tie. Mm -hmm. and, um, and grandpa pants all pulled up high. All pulled up high. That's mm -hmm. right. He doesn't care what people think. If he had hands and he would put them in his pocket, they would jingle. You could just hear the change jingling in his pants. <laughs> Wicked wicker. We couldn't design him in such a way that that he looked too radically different because there's a scene in, in the in the film where um, where can, Cuke is supposed to be confused as to who is the actual uh, Rattan. Rattan. Who and, yeah, and, who's Rattan and who's Wicker? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so, you know, this was, uh, we had to do some minor tweaks, but enough that you could actually see that he's, 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 he was quite different. Mm -hmm. And um, got the red hair and the red tie, and the mole is on the other place, is on the other side of his face, too. So, yeah, that's a fun little thing. So, and then also a little nice little piece of trivia wicker and rattan are two types of um, furniture material, would you say? Sort of reedy, sort of, well, just go to a Pier One and you'll see some rattan and some wicker. As always, on, on all of our shows, we try to take uh, a broad look at the entire show just uh, in color. And, you know, color is a tool that you can also use to help uh, tell stories. And when you go to a, uh, a light and cheery place, you know, you expect something, you know, happy-go-lucky to happen. And then uh, we wanted to make a really big jump to where uh, the last scene takes place, which is in Turkey, and we, we wanted to make a big leap from warm to cool 
Uh, and, and it also helps to emphasize that this is kind of like where the bad guy is. Color also affects emotion. And so what we try to do in a whole color script is sort of, you know, as you look at this page, you know, you can kind of feel the story as you go along, as you go along and make sure that the feelings that you want in the story are reflected in the colors that you're using. This was one of the toughest things to do, Mike, actually. That, like doing, uh, when, when you read the script, it was pretty clear that, uh, that there had to be a really elaborate uh, floor pattern on, on the ground. So, you know, we had to figure out a way of making a really complicated pattern that would actually hide the umbrella if you weren't looking at it from the right angle. It's in, hidden in plain sight, I guess, was the, sort of the idea. Yep, so. yep, that was the idea. And uh, I think it came out uh, pretty nice for the film. Yeah, it looks nice. Now, helado. Helado. You don't helado. want to say, yeah, that H is silent. Yeah, okay. Helado. Now, yeah, yeah that's, that is the proper way of saying ice cream. Yes, yes. Quiero helado. I lived on the south side of Chicago for uh, many years, and we'd have these guys, um, you know, come down the street with this little ice cream cart, and they'd ring the bell, and uh, peletas, peletas, which means uh, little popsicles, you know, oh, so really? they'd be selling ice popsicles. Ah, uh, the Suzy Action Jeep repurposed. Every once in a while, we'll find something we've made before, and we just alter it slightly to uh, to to use it in a new show. And uh, so what we did was we went to the SUV song. We kind of adjusted it. We added, uh, we, we changed uh, the back part of the SUV. Before the SUV song was, I think it was the countertop in the Madame Blueberry where uh, Larry uh, bought a Suzy Action Jeep. Oh, is that um, right? Yeah, so we actually pulled the Suzy Action Jeep out of our digital back lot to put in to the Silly Song. for. So this is oh. like the second or third time that wow. we've used it. We didn't know at that time what the uh, what the so the show would be, the movie playing the would be. The secret film of Noah. The secret film of Noah. So we had to throw something just in there. But we wanted to get the feeling of, uh, of, of the place when the lights were a little bit dimmed. Um, the actual film of Noah, uh, Joe here did all of the stills for you know, the elements for it. So like the animals and Noah and the umbrella. And then I got to animate it. So That's I took right. all those parts and moved them and made it look like an old film. See, Larry the Cucumber can animate, kids. <laughs> How about that? No, <laughs> hand, no hands. <laughs> <laughs> this is an inn. So it's, it's the, uh, it's the uh, Kuman Inn. Built high atop uh, Mount Ararat. It's the oldest inn in Turkey. That's what we call it. And, of course, if you watch the whole show, you find out at the end that it's actually, when we're in the inn, we're actually inside of Noah's Ark, which is kind of a fun reveal at the very end. And we kind of wanted to hint at it uh, from the beginning, but not give it away until the very end when we do the, the actual reveal. So, Actually, kind Chuck of Bulmer designed this oh, location. Oh, yeah, Chuck. Okay, Chuck, Chuck did this location. That's right. Anything involving wood, Chuck is really good at. So Chuck is a woodworker, and he loves working with wood even if he's just drawing it so um so he did a nice job sort of kind of giving that archy feel to what you see in the beams it kind of has the inside of a, a ship feel chuck figured out all the mechanisms for allowing the doorway to to appear behind the fireplace mm -hmm. and that was kind of a, a a lot of a lot of trickery and it took mm -hmm. a lot of thinking um well the ice cave ice cave was one of those locations where when i read the script and i was making the textures for the ice cave I was, I was, you know, I had other films in mind, other cartoon animated films that had done ice just so, so well, and uh, they, they did it just a tremendous job um, bringing, bringing this thing to life. Uh, you, you definitely get a really nice feeling of almost this translucent ice with kind of light coming from, you know, many different directions. And this is another angle of the ice cave. Again, just really nice. I mean, there's just an, an, enough... Um, you know, tonally, you know, with foreground and background and, you know, the way the silhouettes read on each other, it just gives a nice, it, it helps to really inform the space. And, you know, if you look at this in the show itself, it looks, uh, looks right on, right on the nose. Thank you very much. And I, and I hope you guys enjoyed, uh, you guys and gals enjoyed uh, this, this new addition to the Minnesota Cuke world. And uh, I hope to see you uh, again on, on another one because I, I, I love this character. This is one of my favorite characters. Uh, good job. Thanks, Joe, and thanks for having me as your